Let's go. Welcome to Citizen. We have a very special guest today, Michael Shermer. You are a science historian and also run Skeptic Publications, uh, well, one particular Skeptic magazine. Thank you for joining us today. Oh, it's nice to see you again. Here's our uh, here's the magazine. It's an go. actual physical magazine. That's actually a older issue there. But yep, we um, we've been in business for thirty years. Wow. Uh, invest investigating all kinds of claims uh, of any sort. You know, we used to do like UFOs and mm -hmm. UAPs and psychics and astrologer and Bigfoot and, uh, you know, all that stuff, uh, conspiracies and cults and whatnot. But now we've been getting into things like uh, trans issues, abortion, mm -hmm. race, uh, nationalism, economic issues, mm -hmm. energy issues. So, um, yeah, even gun control. Looks like you have a gun sitting there on your sure desk. Do, yeah. Yeah, we, we've, even, we've even dealt with uh, those controversial issues. So. That's our thing. Yeah, there's uh, for I don't know why it, it's never been very scientific to shy away from controversy. You know what I mean? You just follow the data where it goes, and hopefully we can learn some things from it. Um, but there seems to be quite a bit of resistance to uh, a, a, so a solid central epistemology these days in, in the West. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly what that is. If you ask people on the libertarian or Jordan Peterson side, they would say it all stemmed from Foucault trying to destroy the idea of of uh, 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 I guess a universal truth, so they people can just do whatever they want. Maybe it's Marxism. I don't. I don't. I don't know what it is, but I am well, curious that, what you think. That is, yeah, that's part of it. Um, certainly, since the nineteen seventies and eighties, with the uh, literary turn toward lit crit being more Marxist, socioeconomic class conflict, that sort of thing. So yeah, there is some postmodern Marxism there, but. I think it's an actually a deeper issue. Uh, uh, let me let me just finish that thought. So it kind of flared up in the science wars. First, it kind of evolution and creationism in the 1980s, mm. uh, and then the, the broader science wars in the 1990s. And then it, it went quiescent for a while and then picked back up again maybe in the last decade or so with, you know, trans and Black Lives Matter and and woke progressiveness and, you know, and, and – uh, people's personal truths you know my lived experience <laughs> truths and that sort of thing but in fact i think if we take the bigger picture that this is an argument made by some cognitive psychologists like um, hugo mercier and dan mm. sperber that reason evolved not to understand uh, the accurate picture of reality that is veridical perception but instead uh, reason evolved to win arguments mm. that is our brains are evolved to be more like lawyers than scientists that is that you know the, the goal of a lawyer is to win your case doesn't really matter what the evidence is you want to you know uh, present the evidence as best you can to make your client look good and the other side wants to do the opposite mm. and the truth is presumably found somewhere in the jury listening to the arguments on both sides that's why we have an adversarial system in in, in criminal justice which is very different than journalism and science where you want to get the facts straight and and uh, but before the 20th century there was no journalism as we think of it today like fact checking and editing mm -hmm. And even the scientific method of, of uh, you know, replicating experiments and corroboration and, you know, blind, double blind, that's still fairly new. That's less than a century old. So I think th that what we're experiencing now with this kind of challenge to truth, that's normal. Um, you know, people in centuries past wouldn't have had as a goal, we want to get the most accurate picture of the world, regardless of what I, I believe or my ideology or my politics or my religion no in fact your politics and religion was everything sure yeah i mean people who did um go down that path often found themselves exiled or executed for for, for having the temerity to do such right indeed yes right uh, i mean it, you know the death penalty capital punishment was quite prominent for uh, hundreds of different crimes including you know just being a heretic just mm. challenging your political party well party the the monarch the king mm -hmm. <laughs> the dictator the autocrat or the pope or you know the religious leader or whatever you could be executed for that so not only was it not acceptable it was punishable uh for trying to seek the truth that differed from the received wisdom that you were supposed to believe and we're certainly seeing quite a bit of that now i mean so we're questioning what is and isn't a woman despite the fact that you know science is <laughs> yes. pretty clear on what gametes exist and things like that yeah. um we're also it, we're trying to solve other scientific problems with philosophy now 
generally speaking, over the course of human history, that's been the purview of religion to try to wedge that in, right? To try to solve scientific, to try to understand ones and zeros with philosophy, which I'm not necessarily sure is the best idea, right? Because those are two di- very different things. But typically, it's been the purview of religion to do that. Um, mm-hmm. So that's why I think a lot of people, and I, I, t- I tend to agree that woke culture, gender ideology, whatever you want to call it, is just kind of a new religious fundamentalism now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is, right. Uh, and many people have made this analogy, but I think that it has some truth to it. That is to say, the truth is already known, and we know what it is, and you just need to get lined up with that. Well, in fact, you don't know what the truth is. Nobody does. We're not omniscient. I don't know everything, and neither do you. And whether you're a theist or an atheist, you know, if it's the theist version, there is a God, and God is omniscient and knows everything. But you're not God, and neither am I. And uh, he's not going to dictate to us what the truth is, so we have to figure it out on our own. Or the secular version is that there is objective truth, it's out there, but I don't know what it is and neither do you. So we have to come at it as best we can, usually through some kind of systems and tests and so on, and and some kind of methodology we call science. But, uh, But, you know, philosophy, so there's this kind of artificial division between science and philosophy, which is not which is not good because in fact science is a branch of philosophy it's just Mm -hmm. another way of uh determining what truth is philosophers have more than just empiricism you know logic rationality and uh, bayesian reasoning and Mm -hmm. these sorts of things these are philosophical approaches to understanding truth of which science is a branch so i i don't you know a lot of scientists think oh philosophy you know it's dead it's what, what do they know well you're doing philosophy when you're doing science so uh, and so to that extent, philosophy goes back, you know, thousands of years to, you know, Plato and Aristotle and all that. And, you know, so, uh, it, you know, we come from a long tradition of trying to figure out what is true. And we've got it pretty well down now. Not perfect. And it's getting, you know, better all the time. And we have a ways to go. But uh, let's not throw out the methods that we've tried that work just because we want something else to be true. Sure. We, we do have a tendency in the West, and I can't tell if it's progress for progress's sake, that this general idea, particularly in politics, that um, solved problems don't get out the vote, for example. You know what I mean? Mm. So it's, it kind of mm. it behooves people that are going to be political uh, uh, authorities to, to continue a problem, regardless of if it's beneficial for people or not for their own sake. Um, mm. but I, I also wonder why we in the West have – this tendency, uh, and, and it's almost cyclical to unsolved problems that we've solved before, um, for, <laughs> for no apparent reason. Right. Yeah. And then, then, yeah. then applaud ourselves when we solve them again. Like we didn't just act like idiots for the last 20 years or whatever. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, so let's think about political truths versus, you know, empirical, scientific, philosophical truths. There might be a difference at some point where, Like, what's the right percentage of income tax upper bracket? Mm. Well, I'm not sure there's a right answer to that. You know, it's like if the Democrats are in power, they want to raise the upper bracket. Republicans, they want to lower it. Or what's the right percentage of immigrants we should allow in? Uh, I'm not sure there's a right answer to that question that you could determine empirically through science or rationality. That's what democracy is for. In a way, democracy is an experiment, and we just keep running the experiment over and over, and the people tell us what they want. And, you know, that's how it's supposed to work in principle. So, um, you know, to a certain extent, science can tell us, well, if you want um, the following outcome, here's the things you should do. But science is not going to tell us what is the outcome you want, right? This is what Hume meant when he said uh, uh, that reason is always a slave to the passions, uh, he didn't mean party like it's 1999. He meant <laughs> that the goals you set for yourself, like who should I marry, what kind of career should I pursue, or what kind of political policy should I embrace, um, the science and rationality is not going to tell you what that is. Once you determine, well, you know, this is the kind of person I want to marry, this is the kind of career I want to pursue, this is the kind of politics I want to adhere to, then rationality will help you achieve that goal. But setting the goal by its initially – that is probably a different kind of truth. Yeah, I liked what you said about um, the intersection of philosophy and science. And I think, uh, what, well, politics maybe generally, but Western politics certainly uh, is a good example of that, or how they might just be two, two parts of the same thing, I guess, insofar as um, 
you can't yeah there there might be an ai at some point that can tell us the appropriate amount depending on the conditions of tax for everybody or or whatever right there might that might be something in the future obviously it's not right now but this is this is something i've been thinking about lately um generally through <clears throat> throughout history whenever there is a more authoritarian or oppressive or heavy-handed government the general attitude of people tends to turn inward and they start you know thinking more about themselves and trying to protect themselves and when things are less autocratic when people have more freedom or just decentralized authority whatever it happens to be maybe they're out in the middle of nowhere they tend to have a greater uh uh or they, they tend to care more about what's going on with the community when that happens and i don't mm-hmm. know i don't know if that's like a fighter like a broad fight or flight instinct that just plays itself out like that but that is something that we can observe from a scientific basis and and now that's where the intersection of philosophy comes in why is that happening right what is happening mm-hmm. inside the human mind or in the broader uh, political spectrum or in, in this community that's making that happen and i think it's a good it's a good way to think about it right because you're, we're not going to solve all of our issues with ones and zeros and we're not going to solve it all with uh what i believe you've referred to a lot as woo 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 stuff <laughs> yes all right yes well so uh, a lot of that has to do with temperament and personality and you know to what extent are you concerned personally about uh, personal safety security uh, or to what extent are you more open to uh, new experiences you like to travel you're not concerned about security and uh and safety and those kind of personality differences are going to push you toward one political party o- over another so uh, for obvious uh, example there is is you know conservatives want to tighten up the border you know they want to have more control over people's personal lives uh, to direct them toward more more so-called moral behavior that is defined you know by conservatives or religious conservatives and so on so if you are inclined to be worried about safety and security uh you're going to gravitate toward the party that it emphasizes that whereas uh you know if you're more individually uh, individual freedom and autonomy minded versus tribe, nation, flag, religion, and so on, then you're going to gravitate toward the other party. So interestingly, people are not aware of this. You know, if you say, well, why are you a Democrat or why are you a Republican? People will give you arguments like, well, because of this on gun control or that or abortion issue or whatever. Those are my people. They have better arguments. But in fact, that's not does not appear to be what's happening. Uh, people are backing into those arguments after they've already made a commitment to a particular party because of these personal preferences. And and those personal preferences are at least half heritable. So this is where genetics and biology can influence political orientation. And there also appears to be a generational difference. So, uh, you know, the silent generation, the greatest generation, my generation, the baby boomers, uh, were more collectively oriented more tribal oriented nation and so on gen starting with gen x and uh, all the way through uh, the igen gen z now you know they're much more uh, me oriented individual oriented uh they'd rather focus more on uh you know making money and being successful individually and and therefore they're going to migrate more toward the democratic party than, rather than the republican party is one reason why the republican party is shifting some of its emphasis mm. <laughs> to, to so they don't lose voters as the generations uh, grind on and uh, so that tells us there's something else going on with politics uh, i mean why would somebody in kansas that's a you know a working class blue collar worker vote for a republican when republicans are going to lower taxes for richer people not for lower working class people <laughs> and the answer is cuz they don't it's not the economy stupid as clinton said mm. right it's it's other moral values that people hold faith flag family to, to name the big three there for republicans and and people will say that i'd rather have that than i don't care about my economic um preferences as much and so that tells us there's a lot of other things going on at at, at work with with politics yeah and that's a that's a bad thing i mean it's this is this is the the problem with top-down leadership methodologies right because it ends up you, you get the voices of very few kind of spread out over the course of the entire population instead of actually hearing what people think and and how their actual lives are are going i mean it's and then you know you just see kind of a giant collective 
confirmation bias. It's, I, I don't even know what you would call it. I think uh, uh, someone referred to it as manufacturing consent back in the day, almost. <laughs> that's you know, that's uh, Noam, uh, Noam Chomsky's, Chomsky's idea. Yeah. yeah. Well, that, that that's always been the case. Certainly propaganda, and, you know, and, and issues pushed by the state on its citizens. Is the, there's nothing new about that. It's just that it's gotten more sophisticated uh, over the last half century or so with the internet. But it could, you know, silo people even more. But, you know, so this is called the my side bias. You know, mm -hmm. my side is right and your side is wrong. And then we marshal arguments, motivated reasoning, confirmation bias to win our arguments. Again, not to find the truth, but to win our arguments. And with the Internet, it just makes things even more polarized. So it's, it's worse than it's ever been mm -hmm. by many, many measures in terms of polarization. You know, the number of, number of people or percentage of people that identify as centrist, slightly left, slightly right of center, has shrunk. And the number of people, percentage of people, uh, self-identify as far left or far right has, has gone way up in the last decade, or really since not, since around 2004, so almost 20 years now, uh, that this division has been happening. And, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic and Trump and all this stuff, you know, made it even worse. And, uh, you know, I don't know what the solution to that is. I'm not a big, uh, you know, let's regulate social media because I'm not even convinced that's the problem by itself. You know, I think there's other issues involved there. Uh, but I would like to see us get back to an epistemology of let's just figure out what's true mm. to, to, the, to the extent that we can and admit when we can't. Like, you know, you hold the position that, you know, the top upper tax bracket should be, you know, at 33 percent. And somebody else says, well, I think it should be 60 percent or whatever. You know, it's like, OK, so at least admit that, that, you know, that you have this particular belief without any rationality behind it. It's just a you know, kind of a political preference. And go from there but people act like it's a religious dogma like this is my absolute truth and you're wrong about it so and, and not just wrong but the other side you know, the other side's not just wrong they're immoral they're mm. evil they want to destroy america <laughs> right no yeah. they don't whoever the they is they don't they just differ from you yeah yeah it's it's uh i increasingly see uh politicians accusing the other side of trying to destroy democracy which is interesting because i don't know how you would even do that yeah, uh, I don't in, either. In this particular system, that would be pretty much <laughs> right. impossible. But um, right, from yeah, your... I was thinking about that. I was yeah, thinking yeah. about that yesterday with with the January sixth insurrectionists. You know, when they got in into the into the big hall, what would they have done if they really took over? <laughs> yeah, what was you the know, big what, plan? What, like, it's not capture the fucking flag, man. You don't just you don't yeah. you don't own the capital <laughs> right. after you storm inside of it. Right, and it's like so. So, what are you going to sit down and now start taking votes on legislation? It's like, <laughs> do you even know how a bill is passed? I yeah. mean, what they'd be like, uh, fuck this. <laughs> this is boring. <laughs> that yeah, I've I've always I've been saying that since it happens. Like, I mean, it it betrays two separate forms of stupidity one the stupidity of people who stormed the capital in the first place and then two people who thought that that was some kind of legit assault on democracy it's just nonsense to think like that um, i don't even know what a civil war would look like people keep talking about well, the civil war is coming in 2020 now it's 2024 mm -hmm. how would that happen well between I mean, <laughs> between whom and over what is what i ask people because i've been in real war before i know what it looks like i when people say that shit i'm like but the civil war is between whom and over what exactly? If you can't define that, then right. we're not going to have a civil war, you idiot. That's right. I think it's more like something bad is going to happen. Okay, what? Okay, yeah, it's a little bit enough. like the the AI doomsayers. I keep asking them online, what? How exactly does this lead to the extinction of the species? Mm. And no one can seem to articulate this other than something like, well, if they make a deep fake video of Biden saying, "Let's launch the nukes against the Russians," and then Putin will be tricked into uh, launching a you know counter strike, and we'll have nuclear war. Okay. But, you know, there's this could already this could happen anyway. Mm. You know, it, we've been sitting on that brink for 75 years and it hasn't happened because we have checks and balances to prevent that from happening. Right. right? We have a red phone. You know, Biden picks up the phone and says, don't believe the deep fake. That's not me. OK, thanks for letting me know. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's uh, for people who are so critical of government, generally speaking. It is bizarre to me sometimes how much credit they give people in government to pull off conspiracies, <laughs> especially right. like I, I understand that the uh, the CIA had some culpability, mostly from the uh, incompetent side in 9-11. But the idea that George W. Bush, who couldn't eat pretzels without almost dying, somehow <laughs> ma masterminded some uh, right. black flag operation. Like, come on, man. Can't believe right. that. Right. He would have had to orchestrate, you know, hundreds or thousands of operatives. Mm. 
uh, to coordinate the whole thing, plant the explosive devices in the World Trade Center buildings without anyone noticing. There were people in there breaking through the drywall to plant the explosive devices around the support beams. And somehow uh, all this happened perfectly coordinated with the planes flowing into the buildings at the exact floors that the explosive devices were planted. <laughs> and not one of them wants to go on 60 Minutes, you know, not one girlfriend of one of the operatives you know, who broke up with the guy is, you know, is like, I'm going to tell all nothing, mm. you know, WikiLeaks, you know, millions of top secret classified documents, nothing in there about nine 11 as an inside job. Nothing by the way, about the fake moon landing or the aliens at area 51, <laughs> nothing. Right. So that tells us, you know, it's very, very unlikely that any of that actually happened. Yeah. What do you think is, what is it about us, about humanity that wants there to be something more than what's obvious? Uh, what what is that inside us that makes us think that way? I don't. Is it, well, are, are we what, just trying to contextualize our existence, or do we feel <laughs> yeah. do we feel unimportant in that information? It's like that's how, that's why people get into cults because they want access to secret information. I get that. Absolutely, yeah, all of the above. I mean, c conspiracy theories are fun. They're exciting. They're interesting. They're adventurous. Like I'm have secret knowledge about this mm -hmm. inside thing that no one, the deep state or the Illuminati, or the Roth, Roth, Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, the New World Order. You know, I found out about this. Oh, my God. I, you know, this is my 1776 moment. I'm going in. Like Edgar Welch, you know, the guy that went to the uh, Comet Ping Pong Pizzeria yeah, in Pizza Washington, D.C. Yeah. Pizza Gay. He thought, you know, he really believed there was this criminal ring going on that, that Hillary and the Democrats were leading of a pedophile ring against children drinking their blood in the basement of this pizzeria. He goes in there. There's no basement here, sir. What? <laughs> you know, but he believed it, right? I So I think most people, when they say they believe it, they don't really believe it. Sure. But it's more of a tribal conspiracy, like, well, you know, it's or proxy conspiracy. It's the kind of thing those Clintons would do. Maybe they didn't do this one, but, mm. you know, those liberals, those Democrats, the libtards, you know, we know they're stupid idiots and evil. So whether the specific conspiracy theory is true or not is beside the point. It's kind of a mythic belief that holds, uh, again, back to your religious analogy, it, it, it has deeper kind of self-identity components to it that make people want to believe it. And and also the world is pretty complex. No one can predict what's going to happen more than five years five years out. Even you know the best for, super forecasters that use Bayesian reasoning and statistics, they use all the information on the internet. And so no one can predict a very far in the future. Like you know, two years ago, you know, will uh, Putin invade Ukraine? Well, you know, no one knew when he was going to do this or if it was going to happen at all until just before it happened. Right. So. That's how it really works. You know, how come inflation goes up and how do we lower it? And economists can't uh, make up their minds about this. They debate each other about it. And it, so, but a conspiracy theory cuts through all that. You know what? Uh, it's not that, you know, no one's in charge or no one understands. It's actually these cigarette smoking guys behind closed doors that are running the show. It's like, ah, mm. I knew it. Right. You know, the, it's it, it, more frightening than that is that nobody is in control. Right. No one knows what's going on. No one can make things happen like that. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, well, that's a little discombobulating. You mean there's no outside source kind of running the show? Nope. So far, I think a lot of people that's a little frightening or anxiety producing or mm -hmm. discombobulating, <clears throat> existentially challenging. And in a way, you know, that there is a God running the show. There is a government running the show or there's a new world order group running the show. That's in a way comforting. It's like, well, at least somebody knows what's going on and actually the truth is no nobody does yeah yeah that's a that's a really interesting breakdown of that because it seems to me when um an individual or community sense of identity is weak or um there's chaos they do tend to reach out and grasp onto these things and make that I, the pathological part is isn't that they enter because conspiracies are fun it's fun. Like I like watching some of your videos breaking down the UFO stuff, explaining parallaxes and things like that. It's like, oh, okay, I see what's happening. The camera's moving also. So it looks way faster than it was supposed to be. It makes sense. My brain sees that and I'm like, oh, that's cool. That's interesting to understand that now I know a little bit more about physics, right? Mm -hmm. um, but some people get really pathological about it. It's like that becomes a core part of their identity very quickly when, they're, when their uh, baseline sense of identity is weak. You know what I mean? I, and I think... Part of this uh, postmodernist nonsense that's been happening has weakened the identity of the average American. I don't know about other Western countries, but certainly in America. I mean, if you ask somebody from your generation or prior uh, if they were proud to be an American, you're going to get a pretty, you're going to get a lot of yeses, right? For a, for a mm -hmm. variety of reasons. 
if starting with Gen X, it's going to go downhill, right? Quite a bit. And, yep. and, and yep. kids these days, I don't know what they think, to be honest. So <laughs> it seems like you are way more susceptible to conspiracies and fundamentalist beliefs like that when, when you just don't have a strong centered identity. Yes. Well, there's another psychological effect here called locus of control. So people score uh, high in external locus of control or internal locus of control. So if, if you score high in internal locus of control, you're more likely to think you can make things happen. You can detect, you know, di um, direct your own destiny. People high in external locus of control are more likely to think that things happen to them and they have little control over that. So it's more of an external environment pushing me around. And and um, so people high in internal locus control are actually more successful. They're more likely to start businesses and and ask for the raise or, you know, get the date with the person they want to go out with, you know, whatever. They're a little more assertive uh, uh, and a little more conscientious because they feel their actions make a difference. And so some conspiracy theor uh, theorizing happens with people high in external locus of control. Mm -hmm. They think, you know, things are happening to me. I just know I, I can't do anything about it. And somebody behind closed doors is making things happen. Now, sometimes that's true. There are conspiracies, right? There are people that cheat the system or whatever and try to manipulate things. So there's a kind of a rationality behind believing that powerful people with money and political power do do things uh, that you know I can't do or that mm. are slightly immoral or maybe even illegal insider trading or manipulating the stock market or whatever they do. And that's the reason we have uh, the, uh, the SEC and all these rules and laws about that, because it happens all the time. So it's not completely crazy to be a little paranoid about things. The problem is, is most people go too far. They, you know, they like like you said, they attribute to people in power more power than they actually do have. You know, the president of the United States, they, they can't just do anything they want. All right. This is my 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 theory about when you get elected president, they take you in the back room. And they go, OK, here's what's actually going on. Well, but I said I was going to close Gitmo and pull the troops out. Yeah, yeah. We know you said that yeah, on the yeah. campaign trail. But here's why you can't do it. Yeah. Oh, I see. Oh, I didn't know about the thing with our allies there. And we can't just. Oh, yeah. All right. Like Obama is going to um, with with nuclear weapons. You know, we're going to uh, what was it? He wanted to end no first strike. Uh, and and launch on warning and and the NATO allies said you can't do that mm -hmm. <laughs> we need to have that sort of Damocles hanging over Putin and uh, and they were right mm -hmm. right so he didn't do that he got the Nobel Prize for peace for his stance on nuclear weapons before he even did anything and, and then, then he found out yeah, then I actually do can't it. do yeah. any of this stuff right <laughs> that's really and funny. so you know you know CEOs of corporations they can only do so much mm -hmm. they you know, they're not free to do anything they want they have boards of directors and stockholders and laws and regulations the regulatory state's pretty powerful you know so but for you and i that are out of power we don't have billions of dollars we're not mayors and governors and presidents and senators and congressmen so I, what do i know how do i know that they're not doing things that to the average person it feels like there's more going mm -hmm. on than probably is do you think there's a way to manipulate that um so is there a way to teach or train people i mean obviously Tr teaching kids how to think and not what to think is, is an important thing. And that's not, that doesn't seem to be happening very much these days in, in public education. Um, but is there a way to teach or train people how to become more internally focused when it comes to locus of control? Or is that something that's just like an intrinsic trait? I don't know much about Well, it. it's part, it's at least 50, like everything, it's at least 50% heritable. All human traits are. Um, but of course, that leaves, you know, half for you to take control of uh, mm -hmm. yourself. And of course, you can change some of that. I mean, the big five personality dimensions, ocean, openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, introversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. You can you can bump those around. You can move them around. You know, if you're shy and introverted, you can kind of force yourself to go to social events and parties and get yourself to talk to people. And, and those dimensions do change somewhat. And uh, and so that's true for, for all personality, things like that. Um, and, but you have to believe that it matters, right, that you actually can do it. And so there are ways to train people to do that. You know, we mistakenly in the 1980s and 1990s went down the wrong hole of the uh, the ran, ran, wrong path of the self-esteem movement. You mm. know, just everybody gets a trophy. <laughs> so this is one explanation why Gen Xers are 
a little higher in in depression, anxiety, and disappointment. Even though by objective measures, they make more money on average than previous generations, they feel like they don't. One explanation for this is because they all got trophies <laughs> growing up, and then they went in the real world and went, oh, <laughs> we don't all get trophies, right? Uh, there's an actual merit-based system out there, and you know, and, and not everybody can succeed. You know, Gen Xers had, had the highest rated uh, measures of, uh, of like a, a self-esteem, and other like you know, like uh, better than average that you know the kind of uh, you know uh, how good a driver are you? Well, like Gen Xers are like ninety seven percent say that they're above average. Well, that's not possible, mm. <laughs> you know, whatever. So then they bump up against reality that says no, actually half of you are below the mean by definition mm -hmm. in intelligence and skills and driving whatever. And uh, so that's one theory for for this. It's a, an interesting problem. And, uh, you know, so all that affects how we perceive the world, most, most of which is pretty inaccurate, mm. you know, right? We did these studies on the, you know, after the George Floyd killing and, and so forth. You know, there's this, you know, the meme that there's this epidemic of police killing of, of black Americans. It's not true. Yeah. Uh, you yeah, know, you Douglas, Murray, people, Douglas Murray talks about this in his last book, The War on the West, does a really good breakdown of this as well. Some of that data he got from, from yeah. my own Skeptic Research Center that... Mm. Uh, that we ask people, how many blacks do you think are killed every year by police? And, for, and liberals were like an order of magnitude higher than conservatives. They thought it was like a thousand a year. Well, it's between t 10 and 50, depending on who, which database you're using to count. But it's low. It's well below 100. So they were, you know, like an order of magnitude higher than it, it actually is. Uh, and for, for and conservatives were you know much more accurate. So conservatives are less accurate on other things like how many abortions there are, how many illegal immigrants are coming in, or how much a U.S. budget is allocated for foreign aid. Conservatives get it wrong too on other mm -hmm. issues. But uh, but you know our perceptions are not data driven, which is why th you asked what we can do: get people to follow the data <laughs> in the trend lines, not the headlines. And the problem is that the news media and social media are designed to get you to just look on the headlines. Right. Every bad thing that happens. Yeah. And that's not a new thing, by the way. I mean, um, have you ha have you ever read the, the Tim Wu book, The Attention Merchants? Have you had the. Chance no, I, I, I have not read that one. I've heard it. I, I know the book. Yeah. So it's he, he does a it's this isn't the entirety of the book, but one of the big um, points made in the book is that the government since the printing press, obviously through any form of but <laughs> from the time it was kings making proclamations from rooftops to uh, a town crier to the printing press and now to digital media have been using that to their uh, to their benefit but essentially he breaks down how the government immediately began using print media for propaganda purposes in the late 19th century and then mm -hmm. when american advertising when madison avenue fifth avenue started to get big they drew like some of the foundational papers, the white papers on how to do advertising to people came from government propaganda in the later part of the 19th century. And that has mm -hmm. shaped pretty much all of American history ever since. I mean, no, just forget about consumerism and all that stuff, but how we think and what we believe, our entire epistemology is captured by these, uh, I guess, external forces that are constantly trying to capture your attention and manipulate you to get you to do what they want, whether it's purchase something or vote a certain way. Yep, it's all true, but you know that's the, with, with the technology, you know, the printing press that print they can print Mein Kampf, yeah, yeah, but it can print Shakespeare, you right. know. So what, what do you want to get rid of it because it can print bad stuff? Right. Same thing with the internet or or AI, or, yeah, or, or AI, Chat GPT. Oh mm. my God, all these horrible things are going to happen. Well, but there's a lot of good things that could happen. Mm. You know, maybe it'll solve the problem of you know prostate cancer, breast cancer by these massive data set analysis of what we know about these cancers. You know, it, it, we don't want to ban it because somebody's going to cheat on the bar exam using chat GPT. Uh, and so far, it, it's not that good. I can tell, like, uh, if my students submitted a chat GPT generated answer to uh, the question on my final exam mm -hmm. next week, I'll know. <laughs> now, maybe at some point I won't know. But so what? Uh, you know, we just have different measures. So already law professors, for example, are saying they're going to make their students bring in blue books, the old blue books when we were kids. And you have to hand write out your answers, you know, and there's no Internet in the room. And OK, so, the, you know, there's just workarounds. Right. So, yes, AI and GPT will cause more will cause new problems, but we'll solve those problems. Mm -hmm. And that's what we do. Yeah, I mean, yeah. We've always done that. The Industrial Revolution brings all kinds of terrible things, but lots of great stuff. Mm -hmm.
<laughs> so let's don't throw it out. Well, it seems like we focus on the wrong stuff, right? Because it, uh, a large portion of the population is captured by this is odd fallacy right now. It's like, well, life's not fair, so we have to make it fair. Well, good fucking luck with that because you're not making mm -hmm. life fair, buddy. That ain't happening anytime soon. The reality is, is that uh, generally over over enough time, people that put in more effort are going to have a better time at things, but. You don't know if you're going to get struck by lightning tomorrow. Life is just simply not fair, right? And you have to accept not that. that. Right. That's right. That's right. So, you know, there's this new word equity, you know, which means something different than it used to mean, which, mm. you know, equality was just equal opportunities to to be better or worse at anything. And the problem is we only focus on, on certain issues. Like it's unfair that so-and-so so has this. Well, I, I'll give you an example. So one of my students did their TED Talk on the – the so-called what is it the uh, the the it's like the pretty what's it called the pretty bias or something like that. Mm -hmm. Good-looking people get all sorts of advantages, and and, and particularly you know attr really attractive women. I mean, they just get just just showered with uh, all kinds of benefits, gifts, doors open, better jobs, and so. On. But not just women. Taller guys get paid more money. You know, for like every inch in height, you get x more dollars a year on average, and. You know, the taller candidates are more likely to win elections. And so, you know, but I'm at five seven. Uh, you know, it's like, well, that's not fair. Well, but so what? Uh, that's just the way it goes. Mm -hmm. I'll find something where it doesn't matter how tall I am, right? Like writing books or whatever. No one cares what I look like. And uh, anyway, so she had she showed this clip of a TED talk by a, a supermodel, and man, she was gorgeous. And she basically said, look, it's not fair. I won the genetic lottery and this is just so wrong. You know, and she's kind of self-flagellating. And I thought, well, so then I responded, well, what could LeBron James could get up there on and give a TED talk saying I won the genetic lottery? You know, I mean, how many six foot 11 guys can move like mm -hmm. a point guard? Right. And, you know, of course, he works hard and, and, and so on. But that, that's just the way it goes. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, if you're not LeBron James, find some other sport where it doesn't matter how tall you are. Right. Sure, yeah. And and any example like that would fit, you know. It's like, you know, it's like a power law. You know, ten percent of authors sell ninety percent of books, or mm -hmm. you know, ten percent of musicians sell ninety percent of records and songs. And this is true for everything, right? It's not fair. It's not distributed. You know, podcasts. You know, it, you know, one percent of podcasters have ninety nine percent of the audience. You know, the Joe Rogans of the world. That's just the way it goes. You know, I could complain and whine. You could, you and I could. It could have a beer and go, hey, how come our audience is, well, too bad. <laughs> it's just the way it goes. And, you know, the idea that the government, the, you know, handicapper general in uh, Kurt Vonnegut's book, you know, is going to somehow level the field. It, it's not possible. And you wouldn't want that anyway. No, certainly not. I mean, it is, it's, it's usually the, uh, um, the top performers that sustain an industry like that, right? Uh, whatever it happens yes, to be. So right. like if you're, if the world was full, if the NBA was full of, uh, I don't know, if let's say five foot ten dudes, it would be the WNBA and nobody would fucking watch it. You know what I mean? We've got the case <laughs> right. study already. We can look at these right. two things and see which one's better. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I write books in part for a living, so yeah. I, I know that industry pretty well. And the fact is, for the big publishing houses, uh, they are largely sustained by a handful of titles that make most of their money. Mm. But they still publish all these other books, these, you know, scholarly books and, and technical literary, you know, lit crit type books and and really thoughtful, deep, important philosophical books or whatever that sell next to no copies and they lose money. But they're 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 sustained because they have these other, you know, the Harry Potters or the Malcolm Gladwell books or whatever. Mm. And and that's just the way it goes. And that's good. <laughs> that's because it, it allows the rest of us you know, to publish our books that don't sell millions of copies. Yeah, it's, I mean, you know, you could, I guess to some degree you could say the, the same about um, the top earners in a society as well, although I think that might be a little bit more, uh, th there's there's other than natural uh, 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 stimulus that's creating that situation sometimes. Well, It isn't always the yeah. best, smartest product that, that does the best, right? Well, that's true, but you know the market is pretty good at uh, you know at getting the products that are mm. you know are, are useful. I don't know. Let's just think about this for a second. You know, does did Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, Bezos, Elon, did they really earn that? Well, yeah, they did. Mm -hmm. Now, had they been born ten years earlier or ten years later, they wouldn't be doing this, right? It's, so it's luck, timing. Mm -hmm. You know, the the search engine that that um, Larry and Sergey came up with in nineteen ninety eight. 
right? Um, the page search uh, mm-hmm. program. There were already uh, there were already search engines, and theirs was an improvement. But had they not done that within six months or a year, somebody else would have. You know, was, the, the, the culture was poised for that. Same thing with the light bulb, the telephone, the record player. Uh, you know, the, uh, the personal computer. You know, had Jobs been uh, had Bill Gates been ten years born ten years earlier, ten years later, he wouldn't be the richest mm-hmm. guy in the world, whatever he is now. Uh, you know, because somebody else would have designed the software that was needed for the hardware at that moment. Like, you know, there's been studies of this that you know that day he had that meeting with IBM or whoever it was with. Uh, you know, it was like within a couple of days. You know, somebody else would have been there at that within a month. Any case, it would have happened anyway. So, you know, just be grateful that, you know, you found the thing you do or, or the rich person does. And then one other thing on this, you know, we only remember this is the survivorship bias. We only remember the, the hits and successes and forget all the misses. Right. So I, I call this the biography bias after Steve Jobs biography, uh, Walter Isaacson's biography of him came out after he died and everybody devoured this book. OK, what's the secret sauce? OK, you go to an elite uh, liberal arts college dropout, move back to your parents' house, start up a company with your buddies in the garage, and you'll get to be a billionaire. And by the way, act like a real asshole to your, your employees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, how many guys in the 70s dropped out of college, moved back home with their parents, and started a company with their buddies, and they went out of business? And the answer is 99% yeah. of them. Right. Yeah. And we don't know who they are. No one writes yeah. biographies of the losers. And we're still seeing that follow the leader nonsense now in Silicon Valley, where, you know, some of the early companies dumped money into making sure their employees felt great all day. And, yes, and right. there was this right. saying that floated around Silicon Valley for a long time. It's like uh, startups should never think about the money. Well, that's fucking stupid, right? Um, <laughs> right. Just I, I've got, right. I've got, I, I own several companies. I've we've taken one public now. It, that's a really dumb idea, but people mm. believed it, and now we're <laughs> right. like we're still right. suffering the effects of that. I think with all these, um, these tech companies that provide small services we used to do for ourselves for microtransactions, none of them are making mm. any money, you know, mm. uh, like DoorDash and, and shit like that. They don't make any money. They lose money. Uber loses money every single year. So at some point right. that's going to go away and we're going to be fucked. Right. I mean, that's going to be a huge right. hit for our economy. Well, you would know better than I, but so, so let's think about this venture capitalist. I'm told that, you know, like for every hundred pitches they hear, they fund one to the tune mm-hmm. of millions of dollars. And for every hundred that they fund to the tune of millions of dollars, like only one makes it to an IPO or gets bought out by Google or Apple mm-hmm. or whatever. And, and, the, and the founders walk away with hundreds of millions of dollars. I mean, is is that your assessment? Is pretty rare. It, it's that- it's rare that one hits uh, big, but when it hits big, obviously it covers a lot. And also, losses are written off on tax. Those are K one losses, right? So oh, the, right. the 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 expo- once you're once you reach a certain level uh, of financing, the exposure to the financier is pretty limited, to be honest. Mm. So you know, interesting. That that's right. that's not necessarily a great idea either. Some like a almost an unmeritocratic situation where you could just dump resources into it and hope for the best that's kind of what hollywood did for a very long time and look at where they are now not not the writer strike but just in general the the economics of hollywood people in the west don't give a fuck anymore most 80 percent of hollywood's theatrical audience is now in china so (laughs) now all of the is that right yes sir right Uh, eight uh six of the eight studios are owned either entirely or in part by china so these Mm. The people people complain all the time about how there's there's only action in superhero movies now than indie movies. There's no comedies anymore, and comedy used to dominate, right? The reason is is because mm. comedy doesn't translate from the United States to China. It's not the same thing, right? And so you can't get funding to make <laughs> a film like so that. so interesting. I did not know that. Okay, that makes sense, yes. Well, in a broader sense, I think the government wants to cover the losses, allow investors to be able to write off their sure. losses because they we want people to keep investing so we get new innovation and technologies because it helps the country in general, the internet and smartphones, computers, and so on. And so you want the handful, the one out of a thousand that, that gets an IPO and, be, and walks away with a hundred million dollars, the Elon Musks or the, or, or the Peter Thiels or whatever, mm-hmm. because the other thousand, the other 999 you know, we don't want them to be completely destroyed. Let them write off their losses and start a new company. In the same way that the government um, pays me to ha- be married mm-hmm. <laughs> and have children and own a home, and now an electric car of a Tesla, I got I got, I got a seventy five hundred dollar tax write off from the U.S. government. Thank you very much, IRS, and a twenty five hundred dollar check from the state of California. It's like okay, I guess they must want me to drive electric cars. Yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> 
you know, so the, I, I think, you know, society is a whole back to political truths. And so, on. you know, we make decisions like that. What's going to be good for the country in the long run? Hmm. You know, back in the 1930s, we need to electrify all the country. And the electric companies at the time said, well, we can't afford to run a line with all those poles all the way out to that guy's farm 20 miles down the road. So the hell with them, right? And that's when Roosevelt came in and said, no, no, no. In the long run, it's better if everyone in America has electricity because this is the future of the nation, right? So the government then subsidizes the electric companies to run the poles and wires down to every single farmer in the deep south. And that's how that happened. You know, so it's always there's always a little bit of marriage of government and, sure, and yeah. private industry. I mean, it's the same, it was the same with the interstate highway system. It was the same with uh, the railroads, actually. All, that's, right. that's the same model that's been used time and time again. And poor Elon has been trying since 2010 or so, 2011 maybe, because I used to do I used to do some uh, security consulting work for his uh, or for a, for a nonprofit called the Edison Electric Institute. I don't know if you've ever run into them, but mm -hmm. he's been trying for over a decade just to get the government to match his own personal funds to mm. build a honeycomb pattern of charging stations for electric cars all over the country, right? To mm. solve that problem. Like he's like, he's like, we can solve it right now. I just need you to help me. And he's been getting right. protested, called a welfare queen and all this stuff for, for a decade. It's like, come right. on, man. What are we talking <laughs> this about? Is how, this is how it works. Yeah, it's just like <laughs> every, every major leap forward and ubiquitously used technology in the history of this country, the internet was created by DARPA. You know what I mean, mm -hmm. but but the 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 back end stuff, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, the the front end stuff, the user interfaces and stuff, that was all private companies that did that stuff. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's always mm -hmm. been like that. I don't know why people get so jammed up over it. I think they just want something to bitch <laughs> yeah. about, to be honest. Well, there is some of that, right? The negativity bias. People are, tend to be more negative than positive uh, and notice negative things more than positive things. It's just in our cognition. But yeah, I mean, Elon has pretty much single-handedly made made this happen. The shift to electric cars. Mm -hmm. I mean, we'll be by 2030, 2040 maybe. Uh that's all they'll be on the uh, on the roads are electric cars. Well, you know, I uh, old enough to, to to see how all this unfolded. You know, since the 70s there have been attempts at electric cars and they all failed, you know, and there was that documentary in the 90s, you know, who killed the electric car and all that mm -hmm. stuff. And um you know, there were conspiracy theories about this. You know, the oil companies are buying up the electric technology because they, you know, they don't want to kill oil or whatever. And it, w it wasn't that, you know, it was just really somebody with a vision made it happen. It's astonishing. They could, my father was a Ford dealer. So, right. So I had Ford my whole life. And I just thought, well, this is just never going to happen, I guess, by the 2000s. Like, uh, and Bill Nye, the science guy, is a friend. So he used to come over to my house in his little electric car. I forget which one. I think it was the Volt, you know, and he had, you know, he lived in Santa Monica. I lived in Altadena. You know, he had to like charge at my house just to get home. <laughs> and I thought, there's just no hope. This is never going to happen. And then all of a sudden, you know, within a decade, it's like, oh my God, this is happening. And now, poor Elon, poor Elon, <laughs> uh, he may he may not survive because every other every manufacturer now has electric cars, and some of these are really great. I have a I love my Tesla, but mm. a friend of mine has a uh, Mercedes all electric. He's got the, like the top of the line, and oh my god, this is so much nicer than my Tesla has. Mm. I'm like, holy crap! Everybody is doing BMW. Mm. The BMW electric car, it's gorgeous. It's beautiful. Well, especially it's, those German cars because they have a tighter window to go full electric than we do, even. So yes, that you're, you're right. definitely going to see it. I don't know that Elon will be able to get the resources he needs to compete with those guys because right. they're on a deadline at this point. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we'll see. Well, look, this has been a very interesting conversation. I appreciate uh, your skepticism. That's the, I've been watching your stuff for, I don't know. Oh, thank I don't, you. I don't want to date you, so it's been a while. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, it's all right. Um, I'm old. <laughs> uh, if you've got any advice for people about how to approach just general life and not get you know tricked by things... Could you, could you share some of that? Uh, we well, you know, I, I think it, it, it's reasonable to be skeptical of most claims because most claims are not true. Mm. Uh, even by scientists who claim things, they turn out to be wrong a lot, as we saw during the pandemic. Yeah. You know, so but I, I wish public policy makers and politicians would couch their advice and recommendations in more Bayesian probabilities rather than saying, you know, we all have to wear a mask. Don't wear a mask. You have to get vaccinated. You know, get this vaccine, get that booster. You know, as if we know 100 percent and we don't, as it's become apparent, you know, the vaccines will prevent the spread. Oh, no, sorry. We didn't mean that. We, how about just saying, look, we're not sure. You know, here it is, March of 2020. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen. Probably it's good to wear a mask or not. We're not sure. We'll say 50 50. You decide. Right. And but no politicians, they never talk like that, you know, and, or, or just take something like the UAPs. I've been hammering on this recently. 
you know, the whole UFOs, UAPs, you know, what is it? And you know, everybody says it's aliens. It's not aliens. It's hundred percent. Nothing is a hundred percent or zero percent. You know, it, it's probably nothing. It's probably just camera effects or balloons or drones or like the Chinese spy balloon. It's probably something like that. Uh, but why not just say, I think it's probably something normal and natural and not extraterrestrial, probably not super advanced Chinese technology, but it could be. And then people, I think, can reason for themselves. Uh, once they get off the black and white, it's 100%, 0%, and just uh, couch it in kind of a probability. You know, it's likely to be true, likely not to be true. We don't know. And you know that opens your mind up to listening to new evidence. Because if you commit yourself, I'm 100% that, and then somebody says, well, what about this evidence over here? You, you, by definition, mm. you have to ignore it because yeah. I, I, I said publicly I'm 100% committed. So don't do that. That's my recommendation. Yeah. Well, <laughs> since you since you brought him up, I'm sure you remember uh, Bill's uh, debate with Ken Ham, the creationist yes. dude. Yes. And at yes. the at the very end of it, I mean, it was yes. a, it was a kooky ass debate in the first place. But at the very end of it, the moderator asked the two of them what would change their mind. Ken Ham said nothing could change my mind because I believe the Bible is the absolute truth. Yes. Yeah. And that, then, was a uh, great, that was a great. I, moment. I, if I remember, I think Bill just said evidence. And he, evidence, and nothing yes. further, which is that's the right answer. The, 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 and there, there is evidence that would counter contradict the theory of evolution. You know, mm -hmm. if you found, uh, JBS Haldane th famously responded to that same question fossil rabbits in the pre Cambrian, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? You know, where right. there is no, there's not even single cells in the pre Cambrian, sure, but yeah. barely single cells, right? And if all of a sudden there's fossil rabbits there. What, well, okay, it's a falsifiable claim, though, right? It's a yeah, falsifiable that's right. claim. That's what matters. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, this has been a great conversation. Appreciate your time as usual. And All thank right. you very much for coming on today. You're welcome. And thanks for having me on. Yes, Enjoyed sir. the conversation. It was great. Yes, sir. All thank, right. Thank you all for listening. Check out uh, uh, Skeptic Magazine. This has been Citizen.